Greetings, comrades, and welcome to another episode of Chatter in the Skull. This week, we're going to be doing a new segment, something I've had in my back pocket for a while, and I feel like now is the week that I can finally deploy it. And once again, in this episode, we're going to be talking about geopolitics. We're going to be looking at the future. We're going to be talking about foreign policy and trade and that kind of stuff. And not only do I think it's really important from, I guess, a political perspective for someone who is left-leaning to be talking about these issues, because I feel like for whatever reason, it's like a blind spot for a lot of left-wing people when it comes to kind of foreign policy and trade. It's not their area of expertise, don't really know a lot about it, so they don't really talk about it, or sometimes they have really bad and really abysmal takes, which unfortunately take away from a lot of the good things that they're saying and trying to do. So beyond that, I also find these topics very personally interesting and satisfying to talk about. A lot of you guys do as well because you've been responding to a lot of the geopolitical banter on the show. So today I have this idea that I've had for a little while to bring all of these concepts together and distill them together in an interesting fashion for you guys. So what we are doing today in our first segment, and this is going to be one thing that's going to be good for me to do anytime that I'm feeling like there isn't a lot of current events to talk about. It'll be good to pull out an episode like this. We're going to grade them currently on their status for future success. So we're going to look at a country. We're going to look at, we're going to look at five key areas. And I have a report card that I've made up for you guys. I'm going to show you guys, but I'm going to, I've identified five key areas. I think that a country needs that we have to look at to analyze a country's long-term success and we're going to grade a country based on these five areas give them an overall score and talk about how this country is set up to either succeed or fail in the next 20 30 years type of thing so my analysis probably goes to 2050 right in the next 30 years so this is a grade on how a country is going to perform in my estimation for the next 30 years and today we are going to be grading a country, which is literally after my own heart, we are going to be grading the country of India. And I think India is going to be a really interesting choice because one, I think a lot of people don't really know as much about India and the West as they do a country like China or Japan, or UK, but you understand what I mean. I think Indian culture is still mysterious to a lot of people here in the West. And they are a country which has a lot of good things and a lot of bad things, right? So it has a lot of variety that we can analyze and unpack today. And they're a wild card. They have a lot of different ambitions right now, and they've got a lot of different alliances and paths that they can go down, which makes them a particularly interesting candidate for analysis. But before we get there, let me show you the report card and the five factors that I am grading a country on. So I've got a nice little template for you guys. Today, we're gonna to be looking at India. The first factor we're gonna be talking about is economics and technology. This is gonna go into overall economic strength, resources. After that, the next factor we're going to consider is demographics and social welfare. So this is going to look at things like, of course, we're gonna see the how healthy their demographics are. We talked a lot about in the last episode. But within social welfare, that's going to contain things like healthcare, social safety nets, care for the poor, that sort of thing. And this is going to consider things like primary education. So that's the second factor we're going to consider. Our third factor after that is going to be political stability. And not only are we going to be looking at the government and politics of a country, we're also going to be considering things like future trends and how that might impact the political stability of the country. And can a country actually withstand the impacts of any type of future crisis, whether that's economic, climate, demographic, whatever you want to throw it at, we're also going to be considering that when we're talking about political stability. Fourth, we're going to be looking at their military and geopolitical position. So in addition to considering their actual military fighting force, we're going to consider how big their military might need to be. For example, a country that has strong surrounding allies or strong uh, geographical defensive barriers might not necessarily need a large military. So we're going to consider things like that when talking about a country 
But of course, we are going to be delving into things like raw hitting power and raw troop numbers and capabilities and that sort of thing. And last, but certainly not least, the final factor we will be considering is sustainability. We're going to be looking at things like how, how the country is doing in terms of agriculture, energy, how upcoming changes in climate might impact them. Are they doing what is, what is necessary to in a sustainable environment? All those kind of environmental considerations are going to be thought about here in our final factor, which is sustainability. So I think that gives us a pretty good, well-rounded picture of all the major factors that might impact a country going into the future. If you guys think I need to refine this list or if I missed anything, I'm happy to hear anything you guys want added or changed in regards to these. But being said, I think this is a solid place to start. So let's move into our first factor, which is economics and technology. So we'll start with a basic economic indicator with our discussion on India's economics here and look at India's GDP. All right. So here we have a list of, this is the nominal GDP of every country. This is just raw numbers. This is not per capita. And I can finally see that a little bit better that I finally got a haircut. Took a while to find the time where I could finally get a haircut, but it happened. In any case, India ranks at number five, which is pretty respectable. India does come in at number five, coming in at just shy of $3.5 billion, although it does have a little bit of a gap to climb to get to number four. Germany has over $4 billion in their GDP, but India is probably well on track to surpass Germany's GDP, maybe within this decade, maybe it might take to the next decade but they are on track to surpass it. Although comparing it to a country like China, where India and China have roughly the same amount of population, China has a GDP of 18 trillion, which is considerably more than India is making the average Chinese person considerably wealthier than the average Indian person. That being said though, they do have a lot of room to grow and growing India is so let's take a deeper look into India specifically and see what their economy is really made up of. So we're going to delve into the various sectors here, but to give a little bit of context and history to the economy of India, India is transitioning from a more command style economy to a mixed style economy during the Cold War, while never being a communist country and never being a specifically left leaning country politically they did have a much more centralized and command-controlled economy and a lot more government-owned and nationalized industries and resources. Since the end of the Cold War, India has begun to liberalize their economy a little bit. However, they still maintain a pretty sizable government footprint in their economy and their government is pretty willing to intervene as necessary. One of the big things that is still owned by the government in India is the rail system, entirely publicly owned, and I believe it's the fourth largest rail network in the world. Extremely important infrastructure, still in the hands of the government. So they're not exactly a interventionalist economy, but again, they're not exactly laissez-faire either. Right now, India is actually a pretty mixed economy. So going down. We can see population-wise, India is huge. We expect it to overtake China this year. This year, China is expected to fall to the second most populous country, and India overtaking it. We just looked at their GDP. Fifth nominal purchasing power parity. It's actually third. We can see that they're growing pretty considerably. That in 2022, they had a 6.8% growth, almost 7%. Things don't look as good for India is the GDP per capita right now. India's GDP per capita is only $2,500 per person, which ranks at overall 139th in the world. So there's definitely a lot of room to grow there. Moving into just, and then we're going to break down some of the actual sectors of the Indian economy. But as you can see, one of the main things, one thing that does remain pretty prevalent in the Indian economy is agriculture. Agriculture is a big part of their economy in a way that is not the same in a lot of other countries, a very strong agricultural sector there. And so before we get into the deeper specifics of the Indian economy, there's a couple things I do want to 
draw your attention to. So drawing our attention to the Human Development Index, this is one of my favorite index for examining the development of a country because it doesn't just take into example GDP, it takes into things like it says here, span is higher, education is higher, so growth, growth is higher. So there's a couple of different factors that go into the, the HDI. Right now, India ranks in the middle of, middle of the pack right now, 0 0.633. Again, that's pretty, pretty average. And then before we move on, I do want to look a little bit at the import exports. We're going to break this down more. But the one thing I want to draw your attention to is who they are buying from and who they are selling to. Who they're selling to predominantly, interestingly, is the United States. Their number one trading partner makes up about almost 17% of India's gross export product. So United States buying a lot of stuff from India. And we're going to see some of the things that they're buying from India in a second. Moving on, the United Arab Emirates also buying a lot from India. China, not buying as much, but they are number three, only 3%. And then the other ones, Bangladesh, another round up the top five. And other countries make up 6.14%. And that's actually pretty sizable. They have a pretty balanced trade portfolio with lots of different countries making up small percentages of their overall trade. So they're pretty diversified. So they're not really, one of the good things about Indian trade is they're not really dependent on one country to sell a lot of their goods to. Although they do sell a lot to the United States. I think the United States is right now more than happy to buy from India because they want to keep India close to them. They want to keep close economic ties to them. And one of the ways that the United States does that, and this is something we've talked about before in kind of the same way that Britain used its Navy to maintain its empire, the United States uses its economy, they buy stuff from you and they give you access to its own economy and they allow you to buy from it. So if the United States likes you, they're going to buy your stuff. And this is also a way that they boost you up. It's like a lend lease, an economic lend lease program without it being completely overt. But either way, they're not entirely dependent on the United States. They have a lot of other trading partners that they can rely on. Interest moving down here, I find who they're buying from to be much more interesting. Number one is China with 14%. They are buying a lot of stuff from China. The next is United Arab Emirates. You can guess what they're buying from them. And then number three is United States. Considerably, they have a considerable trade deficit with India. India is only buying 7.2%. But number four right here is very interesting. And we're going to talk about this more when we go into the military and geopolitical section of this analysis. But number four is Russia, making up 6%, only 1% less than the United States. Russia and India have extremely close economic ties. Ever since India gained independence from Britain at the end of World War II, one of the partners that they have looked towards to build their economy is Russia. India looking for a country which doesn't have the same kind of colonial past that a lot of these Western countries have. Also, you have a blank slate because before that, India and Russia didn't have a whole lot of diplomatic activity going on. So once India gained independence, Russia at the time, the Soviet Union ended up being a dynamite trading partner for them. And that relationship has maintained ever since to the chagrin of some other people. And again, we're going to be talking about that a little bit more. And then number five is Saudi Arabia. Again, you can guess what they're buying from Saudi Arabia. But now let's look at the details a little bit, because as they say, the devil is in the details. And the details of the Indian economy are quite interesting. We want to go down here and see right now the main sectors of the Indian economy. Overall, agriculture makes up 14%, industry 27%, and wow, 60% service. However, in terms of actual employment, the bulk of Indians remain employed within the agricultural sector, although this is a little bit old. This is 2000, this is 2009, 2010. But we've talked about it before. India, huge breadbasket of the world. Not only do they produce rice, but they produce things like lentils. They produce things like chickpeas. They produce things like specific types of wheat that are native to India that they use to create their flatbreads. Lots of food is produced in India. In India, vegetarianism is very, very common. And this is for a couple of different reasons. One is religious, right? In India is a very large number of religions that exist within the subcontinent. And in many of these religions, vegetarianism 
is one of the is one of the tenets of the religion, one of the forefront tenets of a lot of religions in India. And there's a couple of reasons as to that. And the main reason I think is because at some point someone figured out that by taking your cow and keeping it well fed and taken care of and just using things like the milk to produce dairy products, eggs from the chickens that you're taking care of, these products, instead of slaughtering them and eating them, you can have a lot more sustainable food ecosystem and you can also support a larger population. So I do think one of the reasons why India has been able to sustain historically a large population is its emphasis on vegetarianism because with Indian food, you can feed a lot more people with a lot less because unlike a lot of other places, instead of taking their livestock and continually slaughtering them for consumption, rather they would take care of them and then use the animal products to sustain their way of life and to elevate their food cuisine and increase their caloric intake. It's always been one of those things that seems weird to us in the West, this reverence that, you know, particularly like things like Hinduism have for cows and livestock in general. But when you think about it critically, it makes total sense. It makes complete and obvious sense, not just from a religious standpoint, but from historical and a practical standpoint as well. In any case, the Indian, in any case, the Indian agricultural sector remains very, very robust. And again, it's not just its crops, it's its dairy sector as well, because they consume a lot of dairy products in India. They put milk in a lot of different things. One of the things here growing up where I did is we always had a very high Indo-Canadian population. And one of the things that a lot of people noticed growing up in my area is that the Indo Canadian families would go to Walmart or Costco or whatever, and then they'd just buy tons and tons and tons of milk. And everyone was like, what's with the milk? Why do they buy milk? And well, one of the reasons is that they put a lot of milk in everything. It goes into their cooking, specifically into tea. Like they love milk in tea. Not my jam, but Indian people just love tea and milk. And another thing they do is they also make paneer, which is like a type of cheese. It's like a cottage cheese that almost has the consistency of tofu. And you can make that with milk. And most Indian people will just make it at home. They won't buy it in at the supermarket pre-made or pre-frozen or whatever. They'll just buy a carton of milk, make it at home, and away you go. So dairy plays a huge part in Indian diet and cuisine. In any case... Moving on to one of the important things that I do want to talk about is the electricity sector in India. India is very interesting because not only do they need a rapid piece of the, their growing population and consumption, but they are one of the few countries that is actually looking into some very interesting forms of electrical creation. As we can see here, the main way they actually create electricity in India is thermal power. It's almost like steam power using heat from the earth to boil water to generate motion and create electricity hydroelectricity very big lots of lots of rivers in india but interestingly right now nuclear power only makes up 2.1 percent of india's electricity needs however this is something they are hoping to increase and india is one of the very few countries that is actively building thorium reactors so currently, in fact, the only country I can think of right now that has plans to build thorium reactors, and this is something that is really speculative. If you guys haven't been following the nuclear energy scene, thorium is seen as an alternative to uranium, specifically a safer and cleaner alternative to uranium. Uranium got the spotlight because you can make weapons with it. Thorium, on the other hand, you can't make weapons with it. However, in terms of energy, you can use it to generate energy much more efficiently with it than you, than uranium. So in any case, India, one of the few countries actually looking to build thorium reactors. And that's something I'm looking at with great anticipation. One of the reasons why is because India has, it says right here, about 25% of the world's thorium reserves. So it makes complete sense that this would be the country which is going to embrace thorium reactors. And I am looking at this with great anticipation, and I'm very interested to see how this is going to pan out and if this is going to be the kind of electricity breakthrough that a lot of people are hoping that it would be. But moving into a couple of things that are really interesting here is engineering and specifically automotive and aeronautics industry. 
India has a pretty sizable homegrown industry, both for automotive and again, aeronautics, which is a huge plus in my opinion. I think that a huge benefit, and we're going to talk about this in sustainability, is having the ability to produce and manufacture your own goods in your own country. One of the best ways and easiest ways I think we can reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere is to just move stuff around less. So much of our carbon output is accounted by logistical transportation, boats, planes, cars, trucks, things moving goods from A to B. This makes up a huge percentage of global emissions. And I think if we want to cut that, we should find ways to manufacture more things at home, thereby moving them around less, thereby creating less carbon emissions. So one thing I think India has going for it in that regard is a pretty sizable homegrown industry, both for cars and planes. But not only does India have its own domestic production for both cars, trains, and, and I forgot, I should mention trains as well. Again, trains, very important part of India's infrastructure. So not only can they manufacture all these vehicles themselves, they also gain a lot of, they also gain a lot of traction from other countries looking to manufacture vehicles in India itself. There are so many Japanese manufacturers right now in India. Suzuki is the biggest one. Currently, they manufacture, I believe, I think it's two or three million cars in India for sale per year. So just a crazy, a mind-boggling amount of vehicles are produced in the country. So Suzuki is one, Toyota, Honda, and now Hyundai as well, a Korean manufacturer, is building in India. The Indian automotive industry is looking good. And then on top of that, the aeronautics industry is also looking good. And this is one of the benefits that they had from their command economy legacy. One of the things that, generally speaking, one of the benefits of having a command economy is that you have to manufacture a lot of your goods in your own country, and you're looking to ways to get goods and manufacture them in your own country, rather than having to rely on other countries because this is not your economic ideology. So because of that, India was able to develop homegrown automotive and aeronautics industries, something that a lot of countries don't have. And then, of course, on, on top of that, homegrown military industries as well, which we'll be talking about. So here we can get a really good look at exactly what India is selling to the world. And we can see it's pretty, it's pretty diverse, right? They do have their own petroleum industry. However, this does not cover their own needs, so they need to import a lot of oil themselves. But they do have the ability to refine it within India. Then, of course, uh, diamonds and jewelry. A huge amount of jewelry is manufactured in India. They just manufacture tons and tons of jewelry and diamonds as well. Cars make up a sizable amount. Vehicle parts. And then we can go into agriculture. Rice. Wow, crustaceans. 1.4% crustaceans. All of these represent different sectors. Up here, we have stuff like chemicals and pharmaceuticals which make up another pretty decent part of the Indian economy. They're very diversified. They have a lot of different things that they have their hands in. The one thing, though, is that India isn't really a huge, they're not really a big leader in anything. No, I would accept, say, except for maybe manufacturing diamonds jewelry, India is not really known for being the top of anything. But the thing is that they are excellent example of a jack of all trades. They don't need to be the top of anything that they, they don't need to be the best, the country that manufactures the best cars, the best planes or whatever. They're doing it all themselves in their own country for themselves, which to me, I think is a lot bigger point of pride than being the best in just one thing. However, what is holding India back is that technological factor, which we talked about. So let's talk about education here and technology, because that's going to dovetail into the second factor. One of the things that, yes, India does have a lot of technological prowess going for it, right? They're a nuclear capable country. They have a huge educational system because they have a huge population. Their higher education is publicly funded. It's accessible for a lot of people. One of the things about Indian education, and I'm sure any, any Indian person will tell you this, is how brutal the competition is to get into a lot of these really prestigious universities. India has a huge population and education is, again, it's 
fairly accessible. So the main differentiation factor for a lot of people is your grades, is your performance. So competition to get into those spots is particularly brutal. But one of the things which makes education in India difficult is its diverse language subset. If you're not super familiar with Indian culture and history, a lot of people think that India is a homogenous place, right? There's one type of like Indian person that speaks one type of language, and this could not be further from the truth. There are dozens of languages in India. There are dozens of religions in India. There are dozens of ethnic groups in India. There remain to this day ethnic groups in parts of rural India, which still have very limited contact with the outside world. They have a huge variety in terms of development there. And the government knows that this is an issue. And in fact, in 2020, they moved to reform Indian education in a big way. And this is going to be, again, something that, which is going to be looked at in the future. One of the things that they're doing with this national education policy is reforming in a way that will be more vocational focused. So focus more like job skills, particularly moving into a secondary education. But one of the things that they are doing with this educational program is focusing on having people learn their core education in what is called the mother tongue, their mother tongue, which would be their, probably their household language, which they speak at home with their family and as their, is their primary language. But they are also going to be taught in the two official languages of India, which is Hindi, of course, is the official language, which is the most predominantly spoken language in the country. And number two is actually English. From that colonial legacy, English is very widely spoken in India. And in fact, eventually there will come a time when there will be more English speakers in India than there is in the United States. We're not there yet, but one day that will come. But that being said, that English is a very predominant language in India. And also, if you're looking to get a job or work for a corporation or something like that, English is basically a necessity in India. So everybody there wants to learn it. And it actually is an official language of the country. And it ends up being the language which binds together. Ironically enough, it's the language which binds together a lot of these the languages who don't necessarily know Hindi. They will learn English instead of Hindi and they'll speak English to one another rather than everyone learning Hindi and everybody speaking Hindi to one another. So it's a very interesting dynamic of how languages play out inside of India. That being said, there's going to be an emphasis on making sure people know at least one of those two languages, Hindi or English. So while the Indian government puts a ton of resources into its education, the one thing that it struggles is homogenizing everything together into one cohesive educational structure. It's a foundational issue that exists in India that just simply doesn't exist in a lot of different countries. But before we continue, let us give a final grade to India's technology and economy. Okay, so going back to our par card, I know it's a little bit tough to read that there, but overall, I'm going to give India's economy and technology a B plus. In summary, India's diverse economy over the long term gives it strength. However, its high-end sectors lag behind many of that of its competitors. It does have potential over time to overtake them, but potential is uh, not reality. And I can't give it an A unless I think it's really in the process of either very close to turning that potential into reality or act actively doing it. India does have a lot of economic strengths. However, it does have some weaknesses that hold it back, I think, from true greatness. So now let's move into demographics. We talked a little bit about education. So as you guys know, education is taken care of by the state by and large in India. And the main thing that India does struggle with is trying to fuse a lot of diverse backgrounds into some sort of homogenous state education. But from there, let's take a look at India's demographic tree. So here we have India's demographic tree for 2020. As you can see, pretty healthy looking demographic tree. Not too many old people, lots of young people filling out the bottom there. There is, I see, one particularly glaring issue that can cause problems going into the future. I'm going to move a little bit this way, but you can see that on the side of this demographic tree here, there's a little bit of a sliver that is darker blue than the rest of it. What that means is that is an excess 
of male population. So for a lot of the younger guys, there's more guys out there than gals. And having a glut of young males, which may not see the possibility of being able to have a sexual partner or less of a possibility of having a sexual partner is not a good recipe for stability in the long term. And it also ends up to a real disposable feeling for a lot of guys that they feel like, particularly in a country like India, that their life is extremely insignificant. Big population plus a surplus of young men equals your life is not as valuable as it realistically should be considered by the rest of society, which is a recipe for a lot of dangerous things going into the future. And the reason why you have this excess of young men is unfortunately due to an imbalance in gender rights. The reason you see something like this is because, unfortunately, sex-selective abortions and infanticide are very prevalent in India, particularly when it comes to females. Female babies are a lot more likely to be aborted or killed because of their gender than male babies. It is a very patriarchal society still to this day. Unfortunately for women in India, their place is effectively property, not necessarily for men, but for the family, for the clan at large. And this is something that we don't really have a comparison to in Western culture. Indian families. They're more like corporate structures than they are what we think of a family tree in our culture, in our society. In India, your last name isn't just necessarily your last name. It's a signifier of what clan, quote unquote, you belong to, what corporation, I suppose, you belong to. And let's just say when you're working for a corporation and you notice that the corporation is doing something shady, it's abusing its workers, it's taking advantage of people. It's exploiting people. Do you think when you go and blow the whistle to that corporation, they are going to appreciate that? Or do you think that they are going to try and crush you because that doesn't look very good for their corporation and they don't want their public image to suffer as a result? Almost certainly the latter is going to happen. And this is a huge issue for women mostly, and that affects women mostly in India when it comes to facing their own abuse and their own struggles and their own tribulations, because if they try and go to someone in their family, what that person is most likely going to do is think about how this abuse will affect other people's perception of the family. They won't think about that person who is being abused. They're going to be thinking about how other people perceive their family by and large, which is going to spur them to silence the person who is being abused and to not report it. And sometimes this can become extremely traumatic and extremely messy. One thing that, for example, is common in Indian society is that when a father dies or mother dies and leaves their to their children, it is very common for the daughters to be cut out almost entirely. And this was an Indian person who told me this, that this is a very common thing in Indian culture. And I'm like, you know what, dude, that's, that's fucked up. That's messed up. And his response was like, bro, don't worry about it. Because when that girl gets married and her husband's father dies, then she's going to get all the stuff from him. So what, what kind of justification is that? That assumes, of course, that the one wants to get married and is going to get married, which is a whole nother can of worms that we can open up maybe later. And while it is common for children specifically to be treated as kind of tokens within the family, within the larger Indian family, for women, they never really get agency, at least for men, once they grow up and become adults, they are given some sort of agency and consideration in the family affairs. For women, however, a lot of them effectively remain agentless. It's almost like they, they treat them like trading cards, like to be passed around between other families. It's okay, I'll trade you this daughter for this, or for this son, and we'll trade you this guy for that guy. And it's a pretty messed up process. That being said, I don't want to give the impression like this is everywhere. This is one of those things that as you go to more urbanized centers, as you go to more liberal areas, these kind of cultural mores are less and less accounted for. 
and people are more liberated and free to do what they want to, just as in most places anywhere where cities tend to be more liberal and rural areas tend to be much more conservative and traditional. But outside this glut of men, which is a serious issue, India does have decent demographics. They aren't going to run into anytime soon the issues that countries like China, like Japan, Germany, Russia, all these countries that are facing a real serious demographic decline. India isn't looking at that at all. In fact, it looks like by most projections, India's population will continue to climb until around 2070. And that's going to peak at around just under 2 billion people. And then you're going to start to get that kind of a demographic decline and depopulation. But that isn't going to come for a very long time. So we've got demographics and demographics, let's say, we'll, we'll give it A minus. Almost good, except for the fact that you've got too many young males, which can lead to some problems in the future. That being said, moving on to some of the social safety nets and other assistance programs that India has, we talked about education, where education is taken care of by the state in India. When it comes to healthcare, Indian healthcare is actually a two-tiered system. They do have government insurance and they do have public health insurance and publicly run hospitals. However, private insurance and private hospitals make up the majority of hospitals in India and insurance for these private hospitals is covered through things like employment insurance, similar to ways it is in the United States. And there are circumstances that the Indian government does cover expenses at these private hospitals for people who are extremely poor or in emergency circumstances. For example, unemployed people can still go to these private hospitals and have at least some of their costs taken care of by the state. However, if they went to a public hospital, they would have all of their costs taken care of by the state. At least this is my understanding from the research. What is interesting to me is that even though it is a two-tiered system, like I said, the public hospitals make up about 70% of the hospitals within India. So there can be circumstances where if you are a poor person and you need to get public health care, you might not have access to it because private hospitals are the dominant ones in the country. But that being said, healthcare in India remains professional and clean and exemplary. Doctors, the stereotype is true. Doctors are a very revered profession in India. Lots of people want to train to become doctors and move into the medical profession. It is seen as a profession which has a lot of prestige and respect. So we'll finish up that section here with our demographics and social welfare. India's otherwise strong demographics are marred by the fact that they have an excess of young men, which can lead to issues in the future. India's social programs also remain mediocre by and large. However, they do exist. It is difficult for a country like India to maintain an extensive social net, an extensive social security program. It's a country with a very large population and still has a developing economy. That's to be expected that it can't have the best social services and programs. But overall, I still think it gets a B plus because it does have pretty strong demographics. And even though it doesn't have the best social welfare, it's still there. There's still something. So overall, B plus. And now we move into political stability. But before we get there, we're going to take a very brief and probably random seeming detour for you guys. As many of you probably know, I am a person who enjoys a good bout of Hearts of Iron. And one of the most popular mods for just the Hearts of Iron series, but of course, Hearts of Iron 4 is the Kaiserreich series. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Kaiserreich envisions a world in which Germany wins World War I. And for our purposes here, one of the things I really like about Kaiserreich is that it gives people something different to envision so they can envision different forms of political philosophies, which might have appeared if our history hadn't gone the way it did. And this, I think, opens the doors for people to think about maybe new pathways to go down in the future. And one of the fictional, I guess you could say, ideas that Kaiserreich represents for some of its countries is one that it calls authoritarian democracy. And while I, I would not call myself a proponent of this ideology, let's give you a very brief view of what it means, at least for the context of the game. Authoritarian democracy combines a strong executive power 
with a rigged democratic political system, typically a representative elected body. The aim of these regimes is to maintain national stability as well as providing the people with popular and effective government. So why am I talking about all of this right now? Well, the reason is, is because I think, and unfortunately, maybe I'm getting a little bit doomer, but I feel like India is headed in this way and is going to become the first real life example of this ideology forming in our world. So why would I say something like this? Well, it all starts with the road that one man set India down. And that man is none other than Prime Minister Modi. The election of Prime Minister Modi in 2014 represents a departure for Indian politics by and large, because what Modi's party represented was a much more nationalistic party, a party which kind of no longer was debating things like economic policy under on ideological grounds. This was a policy that embraced its Hindu identity and wanted other parts of India to embrace their Indianness as well. And specifically their Hinduness because they are a Hindu nationalist party. This is what they say they are. This is not a slam. I'm not trying to defame them or anything like that. This is how they describe themselves. And I remember at the time when he was elected in 2014, and because he represents the majority of Indian people, which are Hindus, most of my connections within the Indian community are Sikh, because my wife is Sikh. Canada has a very large population of Sikhs in its comparison to its population of other minorities and groups. And I remember at the time talking to Sikh people and asking them, like, aren't you worried about this guy? Aren't you worried about this guy that he's a, a Hindu nationalist effectively? And pretty much what they all told me at the time was like, no, I'm not worried about it because we're seen as one of the guys, one of, one of the people, all part of the same group type of thing. We're not seen as like one of the outsiders in Indian society or what have you. <laughs> I, then my thought was like, okay, well, what about the outsiders type of thing? Get my bias out of the way. Obviously, I'm not the biggest fan of Prime Minister Modi. So let us go back in time a bit here and talk about what Indian politics were like before the era of Modi, because I personally believe that he has ushered in a fundamentally new era of Indian politics. So before Modi, the main governing party and kind of like seen as the natural governing party of India was the INC, which is also known as the Indian National Congress, or sometimes just called the Congress. And if you guys know your Indian history, that name will probably ring a bell to you, because this party, well, of course, it predates this man. The Indian National Congress really rose to predominance under leadership of Mahatma Gandhi. So this is the party of Gandhi, the party that is very closely tied to Gandhi's politics. And generally speaking, it's a pretty, it says ideology, big 10. So what that says to me, big 10 neoliberal party type of thing is what it has evolved to now. Nominally, mostly center, slightly center left. So not really a left-leaning party. And then everything changed when Modi attacked in 2014. And in 2014, he really brought out, and it was very interesting because not only the party of Gandhi, we have Rahul Gandhi, one of Gandhi's relatives running against the guy. And unfortunately, he got his ass handed to him. The BJP surged in the pools. They gained 12 percentage points. The Congress lost nine points. The, the BJP surged. They got tons more seats. They surged by 166 seats. So they just came in and they cleaned up in 2014 and it really was a huge surge that brought Modi to power and he was seen as a symbol of I guess Indian pride and Indian rebirth at the time so he got a lot of people that were very excited about him and excited about his leadership so at the time he, got, he had a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of energy so over the course of Modi's tenure 
he didn't really do anything that was considered too what would they call democratic what they call democratic backslide he didn't really show anything like that the main things were he would push sensitive cultural issues in regards to historical conflicts between hindus and muslims there was a time in which the mughal empire ruled over most of india and they were islamic empire and projected islamic belief and religion onto india didn't take but during that during that time and during that period the mughal empire built lots of mosques and lots of islamic cultural sites and over time as like as islam has receded in indian society more and more hindus have asserted themselves in these places so it's a very complicated like historical web because Hindus will say, well, for example, there'll be an important spot in India that is important to both Hindus and Muslims. And currently there'll be like a mosque or something in there. And then Modi will stir up people's motions by saying, we're going to destroy this mosque and put a Hindu temple in there. And it will start a debate because what will happen is say, the Hindus will come up and say, well, this used to be our place before the Islamic invaders. And then of the, you know, Islamic people will come and say, oh, this is our holy place. You're coming and you're desecrating it. And it just becomes a clusterfuck because again, these are issues which have hundreds of years of bad blood. So initially that was the only kind of stuff he was doing. But then in 2019, he ends up winning even more. He takes a, a rematch against Gandhi and he actually increases his vote share almost to 40%, which is huge. Look at that number of votes, like to almost 230 million votes. That's insane. So in 2019, he increases his vote share and he increases his hold on power. And with this comes more democratic backsliding as now he is starting to increase his grip on power. One thing he does very early on after winning his reelection is he starts to bring the disputed area up here of Kashmir. He starts, sorry, up here in Northern India, this area is disputed between Pakistan, China, and India. So effectively, he starts to limit the autonomy of the people there, and they were granted more autonomy given their disputed status. So that's one of the things he does very, very quickly after gaining a stronger mandate here. And one of his big buddies, who he saw a lot of political allegiance to, was Donald Trump. And fascinatingly, Donald Trump went to visit Modi in India, and this is in February 2020. And I remember just watching some of the videos from this event and like seeing some of the pictures, and it was crazy how many people turned up. They had this rally in this cricket pitch, and as it says here, reportedly over a hundred thousand people showed up to visit this rally. People say everything's bigger in Texas. Fuck that. Everything's bigger in India. Modi thinks he's got like a ton of political enthusiasm and moving into 2024, which is going to be next year and the next election coming up for India. We have a real what's going to happen because India is a parliamentary system. It's based off of the British political system, which means that he can run forever. So effectively, you can have a scenario where in the Indian parliament, the Congress only has 50 seats and there's going to need to be some sort of oppositional change in indian politics because at the rate things are going it looks like modi is going to maintain his status and power for a long long time there is no political force in india that comes anywhere close to challenging him right now and what this has resulted in is modi doing a lot more authoritarian things particularly when people are saying or doing or investigating some of the shady things he has done. So let's look at something that happened very recently. This came out on Valentine's Day of this year. What happened is on, on this day, Indian tax agents in, raided the offices of the BBC in India and then extensively questioned many of its staff members, according to this NPR article, some for over 60 hours. So let's do a very, very quick reading of this. It's a very short article. Indian tax inspectors left BBC offices in Delhi and Mumbai late Thursday after nearly 60 hours of questioning staff, searching their devices and copying their files. Some staff faced lengthy questioning and had been required to stay overnight, the British broadcaster tweeted, 
at about 10.40 p.m. local time Tuesday. Their welfare is our priority. The raids began on Tuesday, weeks after the BBC aired an article documentary critical of India's Prime Minister. Around 10 BBC employees had been sleeping in their Delhi offices since then. Some of the tax agents stayed overnight too. They searched their laptops, phones of some of the journalists, as well as the administrative staff. Indian officials call this a tax survey, but press freedom advocates say it may have done more to, it may have had more to do with the recent BBC documentary about Prime Minister Modi and, and his role in the anti-Muslim riots. His government has banned the entry for being screened or shared online in India. While rights groups have criticized these raids, the governments of the US, France, and the UK have not. They've been celebrating a big deal Modi presided over in which Air India is buying airplanes made by the United States, France, and British companies. The BBC said late Tuesday that it will continue to cooperate with authorities in India and that its journalists will continue to report without fear or favor. So that is a just a, a small thing that is happening in India that stuff like this didn't really happen before. Stuff like when you would say things bad about the prime minister, no one really gave a shit. People didn't care. But stuff like this, it's a very worrying thing to see happening. And of course, the timing is extremely interesting. BBC airs a documentary which has some critical things to say about Modi. The documentary gets pulled in the country and then days later, their offices get raided. So pretty suspicious if you ask me. And there's just one other thing I want to quickly look at. You guys remember our boy Gandhi? Well, recently Gandhi had the hammer come down on him because he had the audacity, the audacity to have mild criticism of the prime minister. So this is an article from the Associated Press. Let us see what they have to say here. What day, does, what day did this come out on? This is March 27th. So extremely recently, India's top opposition leader and fierce critic of Prime Minister Modi was expelled from the parliament on Friday, a day after a court convicted him of defamation and sentenced him to two years, two years prison, two years in prison for mocking the surname Modi in an election speech. The actions against Rahul Gandhi, the great-grandson of India's first prime minister, were widely condemned by the opponents of Modi as the latest assaults against democracy and free speech by ruling government seeking to cross dissent. Removing Gandhi from politics delivered a major blow to the opposition party ahead of next year's election. So I just want to see if I could find what exactly he said. I'm not going to read this whole thing. Okay. Anyway, what he said, what Gandhi said was, why do all thieves have the surname Modi? All he said, bam, two years in jail. You're done, son. Can't run against me anymore because you said something mildly mean about me. So that's obviously a horrible precedent to set. You mildly insulted me during a campaign speech. You're in jail. You can't run against me anymore. And this is what I mean by a backsliding into authoritarian democracy, where effectively Modi can do things like rig the system in his favor by saying, you said something mean about me. I'm going to charge you to two years in jail. And guess what? You're a criminal now, and that means you can't run against me. It is a horrific precedent to set. And I really hope the Indian people do something about this because the way things are going right now, and specifically the, the power that his party has in the Indian parliament, it looks like that he can really continue to increase his stranglehold. And before you know it, it's not Prime Minister Modi, it's Dictator Modi. So that'll wrap up our section on political stability. And where does that leave us? Overall, I'm going to give India a B minus for political stability. Their future gives me a lot of worry. However, their past gives me a lot of hope. So again, it's, it's a very mixed bag. And that's one of the reasons why I chose India as, as a subject is because they have a very mixed bag. And I think I'm going to have to find a better way to do this because it's, my summary is a little bit too small. I'm, I'm worried you guys might not be able to read it. But effectively, what it says, India's history, a peaceful transition of power, shows that they can function as a stable democracy. However, Modi's current backsliding can lead to an authoritarian future. So again, I am, I am worried about where India can find itself in the future. However, that being said, 
they do have a lot of very bright spots. And now moving on to military and geopolitical situation, let us talk about what India's future looks like in that regard. So let's jump to the map here and analyze India's geopolitical situation. India itself is in a decent spot in terms of its defensible geography because there are only a few points that it really needs to defend against and there's only a few points in which invasions against them can really come from. So one is from here, this gap here from Pakistan and India. This is where the Mughal Empire came from. So this gap right here, empires have flooded into India in the past through here and tried to conquer it. And it remains the largest gap at which any type of land-based, at least, foreign army could come in and invade the country. On the other side over here where Bangladesh is, it's much more defensible. There's things here, there's rivers here, and this area is, is a much smaller corridor. So while an army could invade through here potentially, it would have a much rougher go, not as much terrain they could cross, much more unfavorable geography. Or as you look at over here on the Pakistan side, there's a lot of open plains that potentially an invading army could come over. Then you move up into the Himalayas and that's just <laughs> good luck, right? We have just mountain mountains here that there's no way any invading force is coming through the Himalayas in any sizable numbers. That's one of the reasons why like India and China's shared border. It's even though it is a hot point, it's not like I think any of the countries could really invade one another through it because again, it's mountainous, inhospitable terrain, not exactly the kind of terrain, particularly when you're talking about two countries with billions of people, you're going to be funneling people through. So India has pretty decent and defensible geography. They really only need to worry about one point that the enemy can come over them through land. And right now, India and Pakistan are not friends. They never really have been friends, obviously, during the messy independence wars and subsequent wars between the two countries. Both of them have developed a lot of animosity towards one another. Both of them are nuclear armed and both of them don't like each other at all. So unfortunately for India, it does not get along that well with its largest land-based neighbor. And in fact, a lot of their neighbors like Nepal and Bhutan aren't on best terms with India either. In fact, they're on better terms with China. A lot of their neighbors, they don't get along with that well. That being said, they do have a lot of powerful friends and people that they can rely on because India has various ports and trading and trading nodes. There's plenty of trade that comes to the country. It's very difficult to stop maritime trade going into India. You'd have to have a Navy, which outnumbers India sizably. And there are very few countries that could do that outside of the United States. And India is also a country which recognizes that it needs to have some maritime capabilities. So they themselves are developing a small but respectable Navy. So India maintains good relationships with a lot of countries further afield from them. Number one right now being the United States. They maintain close relationships and they will continue to have close relationships because India has a strong rivalry with China. They do not get along. They have never really gotten along. I think India wants to be the number one player, the number one guy in Asia. And before they can do that, they got to get China out of the way. So there's a big rivalry there. So with the enemy of my enemy is my friend. That opens the door to the Indo-American partnership. And with that partnership comes a lot of people like Japan, Korea, New Zealand, Australia, a lot of other countries that have pretty sizable and developed economies that want to do trade and want to with you and all be on the same page in regards to Chinese containment. But more further afield, India is very interesting in terms of some of the relationships that it has. One of the big relationships that we talked about earlier is the, the relationship between India and Russia. And to this day, this relationship remains very tight. 
if anything, right now, India is almost like a backdoor Russian ally, like an under the table Russian ally. And most people don't care. It does piss off the United States. The United States has brought it to India's attention that they have a lot of support for Russia and India doesn't care. They're not going to jettison this long-term economic partnership. And the United States isn't going to really do anything about it either because they need India to be on their good side as a counterweight to China. So while the United States is going to complain about it, they aren't in a position to actually really do anything about India and Russia's economic relationship. And right now, I think that that is only going to grow deeper and deeper because one, Russia needs lots of stuff from India. India has lots of stuff they can give to Russia. They have complementary needs. And Russia's vast developing relationship with Iran makes trade between Russia and India easier than it's been in quite some time. There is a concept called the Iranian Corridor in which goods can be sent into Russia through Iran and the Caspian Sea. And because now Russia and Iran have very complementary needs as well, we are seeing a vast developing alliance between them. So, for example, India can take goods, or Russia can take goods, start them off, and maybe we'll start them off in Mumbai here, and then they go up to Iran, they dumped off here, dumped off in the ports in Iran, and then they take a train across Iran up to the Caspian Sea. They once again get loaded onto cargo ships across the Caspian Sea, and bada bing, bada boom, you're in Russia now. And of course, Russia can send goods to India the same way. And this corridor cuts off a huge amount of time because before that, you'd have to go, you could take the sea route really and trade through India up through here, up through the Suez, up through here, through Turkey, through the Bosporus, and uh, into here. And while it's nice that that's all one continuous maritime based route, there's five bottlenecks here that can be used to disrupt trade. So it's shorter and less disruptive for the Russians. That is something that I see happening more and more is that the Indo-Russo relationship is going to deepen simultaneously with the U.S. relationship because India needs the United States. The United States needs India and Russia needs India and India needs Russia. So all of these people need each other, even if they don't want to say it. So in terms of India's geopolitical position, it's quite good. They aren't very constrained. And while they do have a lot of friction with their neighbors, they also have a lot of powerful friends that they can rely on to counterbalance that. So now let's delve into the armed forces of India, because I think India has a lot of good things going for it in terms of their army. Not only is it massive, like huge, millions and millions of people in standing and reserve, but it also has a very strong domestic military industrial complex, which means that in the event of any kind of prolonged war, India is not as beholden to other nations to keep its military industrial complex running. They do a lot of their things in house. They have robust small arms industry. They have their own main battle tank. They have a robust aeronautics industry which again allows them to, if things go to some sort of war of attrition, they can continue to produce equipment and keep fighting. So in, C in terms of raw numbers, we can see that the Indian army is huge. Combine all their forces, they have a million and a half active personnel and just over a million in reserve. And unfortunately, their navy is the most underwhelming part of this whole equation. One of the parts of the equation I think India needs to step up their game it's decent, but it needs to be better if they really want to contend on the level that they're hoping to contend with. But just to give you a look, here is the Arjun tank. This is the main battle tank for India. It is a impressive piece of equipment, albeit we don't really know how it would actually, when the rubber meets the road, function in battle. It is very heavily inspired from the T-90, I believe. That being said, T-90 has a mixed repu reputation, but that being said, the fact that they're able to produce domestically their own main battle tank is definitely impressive in my opinion. Not many countries can do this. 
And India also has its own domestic manufactured main battle rifle, assault rifle called the Excalibur rifle. And I actually didn't know this because I was like trying to think, does India have a rifle? Like I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of various games like Call of Duty and the like Counter-Strike. I'm like, I don't think I've ever seen an Indian rifle in any of those games. And I look it up, it turns out, yes, they do have their own domestically manufactured rifle. It is the Excalibur. Man, I'm sure someone who is a much better firearms expert than me, I consider myself definitely middling at best in terms to identifying firearms. I look at that and it reminds me of something I've seen before. I'm sure someone in the comments will say that's a, it looks like a copy of this rifle. But that being said, they do have their own domestically manufactured rifle that they can rely on. So before we wrap up, we'll just touch on the Air Force and Navy. It's Navy is okay. They do have a nuclear powered submarine and a couple of submarines, only three submarines. The big star of the show, however, are their two aircraft carriers, including one domestically made aircraft carrier. The Vikrant class, that is another thing that most countries cannot do, a elite produced aircraft carrier. They also have a Kiev class, which is based on a Russian design. And then moving on, they do have some destroyers, frigates, corvettes, but that's about it. No battleships, nothing like that. But again, the battleship is an obsolete feature these days. But in terms of their surface fleet to support their aircraft carriers, it's pretty minimal. It's pretty skimpy. But again, the fact that they have aircraft carriers at all is, is something to be proud of. So the Indian Navy, not nothing compared to the Chinese Navy, their number one rival, their Chinese Navy outclasses them considerably. However, the Indian Navy could very easily support the Australian Navy or the Japanese Navy or the American Navy against the Chinese Navy in some sort of all-out war. And then lastly, the Indian Air Force is increasing. Most of their designs are old Soviet designs because, again, the Indians and Russians had a very tight relationship. So a lot of their designs are based off Russians. However, the HAL Tejaz is their own domestically manufactured fighter jet. Currently, they don't even have it as their number one most populous fighter jet in their inventory but that being said they are domestically manufacturing their own goods so again none of the equipment that the indians have is necessarily the best but the important thing is that they have the capacity to produce their own and if they needed to they can replace their losses so for example canada we don't produce our own tank we our tanks are a leopard twos and trudeau sent about half our tank fleet to ukraine which is fine. I definitely support that. But the thing is now we don't have any tanks to, to replace them because those are German tanks. We would have to go to Germany and say, hey, we need more tanks. And Germany says, oh, we can't give you any more tanks. We already sent all of our tanks to Ukraine. So that is the issue when it comes to not having your own domestic military industrial complex. So wrapping up this section in terms of its military and geopolitical position, I'm giving India a solid A. They've got a lot of good allies further afield, and the fact that they have a very strong geographic position and a large army supported with domestic equipment makes up for the fact that a lot of their neighbors they don't get along with very well, and some of those neighbors are pretty powerful. But uh, overall, I think uh, India, very strong military, very good geographic position, strong partners, strong allies, so they are in a good position making this one an easy A. So we're going to wrap up today with sustainability. Unfortunately, I'm not going to have any feel-good story. I've just realized this has gone on a lot longer than I thought it was going to. Next time I do this, I'm going to have to make it much more succinct. But anyway, let's examine the sustainability of India. And I think as many of you may have guessed personally, I think it's not great. Let's look at a map here. This is a map of current global air pollution. And as we can see in India, it's pretty rough. The only places that are really worse than India are China and some places in Southeast Asia and uh, maybe a handful of places in Africa. But overall, India's air pollution is very bad. They live in very populated cities and some of them don't have the cleanest energy. Coal can be a factor. Not only that, in terms of sewage and water filtration and garbage collection, a lot of these aspects of everyday life, which we take for granted, are lacking in India. India also gets a lot of the proportion of the 
global waste and trash, particularly when it comes to electronics. And this has resulted in a lot of the rivers being polluted to lengths, trash overflowing on the banks of the road, just really messy and horrific conditions in some urban places in India. So when I look at this, I, I see a lot of, of bad omens for sustainability in India. And I worry that they may pollute their cities to the point where they become uninhabitable. And this is another thing I worry that will happen in China. It'll probably happen sooner than China than in India. But at the rate things are going for India, pollution is an extremely serious problem that needs to be addressed. Here's another article. This is from Reuters. This is from the 10th of January of this year. This is in regard, fuck you, go to hell. I don't want to give you your feedback. You can rot. I don't know why that got me so upset. Sorry about that. That was uncalled for. Anyway, India announced this year that they expect their coal usage to increase, as it says here, after a shortfall in renewable technology. Coal is probably not going anywhere in India for quite some time. They have a huge population and they're not going to let those people go without electricity. And not only that, we talked about this, like they are a population which is coming more and more online, becoming more and more engaged with the world. One of the things that even though a lot of people in India don't have a lot of money, things are extremely cheap in India. Vehicles in India can, you know, a vehicle that would cost you $20,000 costs $4,000 in India type of thing. The a cell phone here, which costs you $300, can cost you $10 in India. And they have specific phones, smartphones, which are designed for the population of India's needs, which are extremely cheap. And with these extremely cheap smartphones, this has now allowed people in places like rural India to come online to the World Wide Web in, in ways that they never before in, in history. And this is one of the reasons, like, I don't know if you guys remember, like when fucking there was that big internet controversy between PewDiePie and what the hell was it, T-Series, I think it was, to see who was be going to become the number one most subscribed to YouTuber. And it's like this big deal. It's like, oh, we got to stop. What the hell was it? Was it T-Series? I can't remember what exactly it was. But either way, though, everyone's like, oh, we got to stop T-Series from overtaking Pew PewDiePie. And I'm like, you're never going to stop this because what they are is a music platform for Indian music videos and more and more Indians are coming online and guess what? They like the same shit we do, which is to watch stupid music videos on their phone. So guess what? They're all going to subscribe to a channel, which offers them nothing but stupid music videos on their phone. And there's no way you're going to ever stop the billions of Indians coming online from subscribing to this channel. So it's like a done deal. You're never going to be bigger than this channel. You should give up now type of thing. But either way, I, I thought that there was just a really dumb controversy back in the day. The whole point here that I'm trying to say is that Indian people are coming online. They are becoming engaged with the world. And because of that, India needs more electricity and they got to get it from somewhere. They're gonna, if they need to get it from coal, they're going to get it from coal. And unfortunately, I don't think, like I said, this is going anywhere anytime soon. When it comes to sustainability, the one positive that I have is thorium power for India. We mentioned it before, thorium is a much better alternative to uranium. And if they can get their thorium power online, a, it'll be a huge boon for the country. They won't need to worry about their energy pollution as much. They won't need to worry about where the next energy shipment is going to come from. And they won't need to worry about having to figure out how they're going to keep the lights on for almost 2 billion people in the year 2070. But overall, though, unfortunately for India, their sustainability rating is just not great. So now with our final category finished, we can check out sustainability. Going to have to give them a C minus. India's pollution and use of non-renewable energy does not bode well for the country's long-term sustainability. So yeah, unfortunately, really not too much more to say on that regard. But with all of our factors inputted, we can give a final summary for India and give them a final grade for the future. So now with everything inputted, I have finally come up with a grade for India, and I am going to give it a total grade of a B plus. I think India has a lot of great things going for it. It's definitely got more advantages than disadvantages. It has many advantages such as a young population, strong international partners, 
and a growing advanced engineering sector. However, its growing authoritarianism and pollution problems may make it so that this country that has so many advantages doesn't actually get to see its time in the sun. Overall, India is a country I have high hopes for, and it is a country that I think has probably about a 50% chance of overtaking China as the predominant player in Asia. That being said, again, they do have some serious disadvantages that they need to work through. Trying to organize a country of 1.5 billion people is no easy task, especially when that country has two dozen different ethnic groups and three dozen different languages. It becomes even more difficult. That being said, I think India has so many positives going for it. It, a, it is a country that I'm pretty, what do they say? What do the capitalists say? Pretty bullish on. So overall, I think India, thumbs up. And I really hope that, again, it gets its time to shine. And with that, unfortunately, it's going to bring us to the end of our episode. I just do not have time for a feel-good story today. I am so far behind, and this episode took me way longer than I thought it would. It was great fun. Again, I had been planning something of this for a while. But next time I do it, I got to find a way to streamline it. With that, I want to thank you guys for watching. This has been DeComrade, signing off for now. Until next time, you guys take care.